Hey guys, David with the First Place Auto Parts. You know, today we take for granted trucks that are good enough and comfortable enough to be a daily driver. If you look all over the United States, on highways or around your town, I'm sure you're seeing pickup trucks that have never had anything put in the bed, never pulled a trailer, but are fantastic for being a daily driver. And that wasn't always the case. Look, back in the early 30s, 40s, all the way up to 1970, trucks were very rugged vehicles. They weren't exactly something that you were gonna take your wife to church on Sunday, and that all changed with a letter from an Australian farmer's wife who wrote this letter to Ford, Australia, asking for a vehicle that was nice enough to go to church on Sunday, but be able to take their pigs to market on Monday. From that letter, the whole world changed for trucks. And in today's video, we're gonna take a look at the progression of how the truck and the car were combined to give you more comfort, but also have more towing capacity as well. So today, we're talking Carux. Hey guys, if you like today's video, please consider subscribing to the First Place Auto Parts YouTube channel. We're gonna continually be adding new videos every week and we go to some pretty cool car guy stuff. I'm pretty sure you're gonna wanna see. Now back in the 30s, the automobile manufacturers actually read your letter and the letter reached the designer at Ford in Australia and his name was Lou Brandt. And what he did was he designed off of the 1932 Ford five window coupe and essentially made a U, which is short for coupe utility. And he added a five and a half foot bed to this thing. With that five and a half foot bed, it had a towing capacity or a hauling capacity of 1200 pounds, which matched that farmer's needs to be able to take his pig to market on Monday. It's really where this, the utility truck or the combination of a car and a truck came to be with a focus on comfort, but also a focus on work. Now, fast forward all the way to the early 1950s, and the Ford Ranchero is really the first vehicle that we can credit with being a Karak, which is the combination of a car and a truck. The first Ford Ranchero came out in December of 1956 for the 1957 model year. The first Ranchero was based on the Ford Ranch Wagon. It was available in Fairline leg trim as the Ranchero Custom. In 1957, the new Ranchero offered a payload capacity 50 pounds more than the F100, combined with the new styling from Ford's new 57 full-size lineup. The first generation of the Ranchero spanned from 1957 through 1959. Now the Ford Ranchero, it went through seven generations and it went through a lot of change, starting with the second gen Ford Falcon based Ford Ranchero beginning in 1960. The smaller Ford Ranchero based on the Falcon chassis ran from 1960 to 1965 before switching to the mid-sized Fairlane based chassis for the third generation, 1966 to 1967. The fourth generation of the Ford Ranchero ran from 1968 to 69, and the Ford Fairlane was discontinued after the 1970 model year. But the Ford Ranchero continued to be based on the full-size Ford platform. The fifth generation Ranchero ran from 1970 to 71 and took most of its styling cues from the Ford Torino. The Torino inspiration continued into the sixth generation, which ran from 1972 to 1976. The seventh and final generation of the Ranchero ran from 1977 to 1979 and was based off the Ford LTD2 midsize platform. Now, typical GM was late to the party. Look, do I have to mention the Mustang and the Camaro? And understand, guys, I'm kind of a GM guy. GM always seems to follow whatever it is that Ford does when they have a good idea. And in this case, it was no difference. Two years after the first Ranchero appeared, GM released her El Camino in 1959. And in 1959, the first generation El Camino was based off of the GM B-Body platform, more specifically the Brookwood two-door wagon. The 1959 El Camino sold well and outsold the 59 Tranchero 22,000 units to 14,000 units. That same success did not continue for the 60 model year, however. The Ranchero transitioned to a smaller Falcon-based car truck. Between the less than ideal sales year and Ford's move to a smaller platform, Chevrolet discontinued the El Camino at the end of the 1960 model year. Now, after a couple years off, after licking its womb, GM finally came to its senses and re-released the El Camino. 
The next generation of El Camino was based on the 64 to 67 GMA body and more specifically the Chevelle two-door. The second generation El Camino, it was a sales success with really strong numbers and consistent sales numbers and it got even better. Starting in 1968 model year that ran all the way through 1972, the third generation El Camino is perhaps the one we're most familiar with. Look, this is where muscle cars and trucks ran headlong into each other and gave us a truck that ran like a muscle car. Remember the 1970 SS El Camino with the 454? You could get that thing with a four speed two and a Colin induction hood. Everything changed in that time frame, and it was a really cool car truck that you could go to work with, haul a trailer with, but then go to the drag strip with as well. So this is where cars and trucks, or the Karak, really started to come into its own. The third generation El Camino was based on a Chevelle four-door station wagon instead of the two-door wagon like the previous generation, allowing for a longer wheelbase. The third generation of the El Camino also brought with it the badge-engineered GM Sprint, which appeared in 1971 and ran through the 72 model years. And hot on the heels of perhaps the most popular version of the El Camino came out in 1973 as the fourth generation El Camino. Look, the fourth generation from, ran from 73 to 77, which was a tough time for automobile manufacturers in America. It was the new body style called the Colonnade body that really was applied to this truck. It got really big and really heavy, and it also combined with a lower compression ratio, the difficulty in finding fuel, and really abysmal fuel economy, these trucks just aren't popular back then and they're not popular today. Look, the collector car market pays these things no mention. You can pick them up fairly cheap and if you want a big vehicle that's a Karak, it's not a car, it's not a truck, it's both. These things are actually fairly affordable. Just know that the automotive restoration side of things isn't as strong for these trucks like it is for the 68 to 72. Sales were still strong by the mid to late 70s, but as we got closer to the 80s, things were about to change for the Karaks. The fifth generation Karak came out in the El Camino version where it transitioned from it being based off of the A body to the G body in 1978. Sales of the fifth generation trucks were strong from 1978 and 1979 with 54,000 and 58,000 models produced respectively. But in 1980, sales dropped to 40,000 units, and the slide continued until the El Camino was ultimately discontinued after the 1987 model year, with a dismal 13,000 models produced. The times in the 80s, they were a change in, and the decline in interest in the large Karaks can be tied directly to America's increased interest in fuel efficiency in smaller vehicles. Times had changed in the vehicle, the Karak had to change as well if it was gonna stay a viable type of vehicle. And you know what? The reality is in the mid 80s, we got a lot of variants. They weren't GM and they weren't Ford, but we got some different variants of the Karak that became popular during that time that actually could haul something but still got decent fuel economy. And for me, it's kind of interesting because Ford and GM, they didn't really play along in this smaller Karak market. It was VW with their Rabbit based truck or Subaru with their Brat based truck. This was a, called a Brat. Remember the one, the truck that had the seats in the back of the bed? Or even Dodge with the Rampage, which is based off the front wheel drive version of their K cars. Look, the other manufacturers realized that there was some value in a car and a truck combination where the big two, Ford and GM, just stepped away from it. Crocs, they're pretty cool today. Look, maybe you want something that doesn't ride as rough or has a few more creature comforts to it, but you still want a bed or you want to be able to tow something. In that case, a Karak makes perfect sense for you. Look, the 68 to 72 GM versions have huge support from the automotive aftermarket, as does the earlier the first generation Ranchero. The Karaks are here to stay, and we're starting to see them even today in the form of the Honda Ridgeline and the Kia truck is or car truck as well. So Karaks are coming back. People like them. The reality is that new trucks are so good and so capable is not only daily transportation, but also the ability to haul. We'll see where the Karak goes from here, but the reality is the sport utility thing, the thing that I thought started maybe 20, 25 years ago, 
really had its history all the way back in 1932 with that simple letter to Ford from that Australian farmer's wife. I appreciate you watching our video today and taking a, hit, a little bit of a trip down history's lane. Look, crocs have been around for a long time and if you've ever wanted one, now's not a bad time to get one. They're classic, they're American, and some of them have some really big engines in them as well and can go pretty fast. So the Karak, it's a legitimate muscle something. Is it a muscle car or muscle truck? I'm gonna let you guys decide on that one. Guys, we have a ton of performance and restoration parts for the American muscle car, the American truck, and the American Karak as well at First Place Auto Parts. Visit our always open, easy to use website. Like it's open 24 seven, right? And you'll find that all the performance and restoration parts you need to bring your car or your Karak up to a level where you want it to be. Guys, until next time, keep the hammer down and keep it between the guardrails.